Reza is an astoundingly courageous Honduran journalist and human rights defender, and her work was initially motivated by the disappearance of her brother by the state it's nearly 30 years ago now. Um, and since then, she's endured constant threats uh, to herself and to her family, including uh, she's got three children, and it includes she's had sexual threats to her daughter and unimaginable things, and she needs protection around the clock. So in line with the parenthood theme that's been emerging through some of these readings, um, my tribute to her is called Wolf Mother. My daughter surprised all of us by growing a loose golden afro as soft as a cloud. What with her blue eyes, it causes a lot of people to assume that she and her dad aren't related, and it's a paradise head lice, but it's worth all the hours of painstaking combing. She says t instead of ch, and f instead of f. She pecks at dry cereal flakes like a little sparrow, eats only the white of egg, licks the honey off her toast, and makes every pancake into a metascope. She's exceptionally tall for her age, only just three for the height of a five-year-old, and implausibly bambi-legged. She could be a supermodel, I'm often told in knowing tones, but I'll do all I can to keep her future adolescent body safe from judging gazes. When she doesn't get her way, she throws back her peachy cheeks and lets her epiglottis vibrate like a fire bell at a pitch no human can endure for very long. And she knows it. When she's sleepy and calm, she strokes my face and hair like I'm a new kitten. And when I lean down to kiss her goodnight, she'll get me in a headlock under her arm, clinging to my skull like a rugby ball that she never wants to touch down. When she sings, her timbre is exquisite as blackbirds and she's bang in tune. Her favourite toy is a scruffy and malevolent chicken, whose gimlet eye she mimics when she wants to bend my will. Her older brother is the world's most beautiful boy. He doesn't know it, but his coppery skin, sleek black curls, and rainbow smile radiate energy and light and promise to open doors to life's best kept secrets. He knows all the dwarf planets and names of distant stars, and can list the rarest dinosaurs like their old friends, and he's intimate with the inhabitants of Mariana Trench. Last time we played 20 questions on the way to school, I gave up. <laughs> Shall I tell you? He asked. Tell me, I conceded. A Ben Pokadon, he said. Triumphant, but mildly disdainful of my influence. It's a deep water jellyfish, shaped like a bell because he also didn't know. He can leap like a gazelle, swing easily from monkey bars, and devour stories like Augustus Glue did chocolate cake. He can listen in rapture for hours, snuggling up against me until my voice is hoarse. And he believes that he, like Matilda, will one day learn to move objects with his eyes. When he doesn't meet his own expectations of himself, he can descend into a furious grump. But within five minutes, he'll be sparkling as if nothing had happened. He's translated the beat language spoken by his toy robot. His alter ego is a peregrine falcon that can dive at 60 miles an hour. And at five years old, he's so worried about climate change and its effects on animal life, he's decided to become a vegetarian, which both pleases me and breaks my heart. He's engaged to a girl in his class, saves her grapes at lunchtime. He could scrape out rigadoon on his cello, and he dances the coconut calypso like his limbs are made of slinkies instead of bones. I can still just about pick him up and throw him onto our bed to tickle him, but it takes all my strength. I lost him once. He was two and his sister was a baby. We were out in the park on a balmy summer day when I was changing her nappy, and when I looked up, he'd gone. I scooped up the baby and circled the fenced off toddler area once, then twice, keeping studiously calm, but he was nowhere. The panic churned, my feet picked up speed. I told every adult I passed, speaking too fast, that they understood from my face alone, and we all fanned out like a newly oiled machine, searching, calling. I headed half blind towards the road. He'd always been so good about roads before, but what if? The baby was being jiggled and grasped too tight, started to cry as time slowed and fractured around me. How could I continue living if? And then he emerged from a bush that he'd been imagining as his den in the jungle book where he lived with Mother Wolf. And right at that moment, I was Mother Wolf. From heckled neck to claw, I was pure animal. When I became pregnant for the second time, I was happy. But all the same, I couldn't imagine having an inch more space in my heart to love a second small person with the newfound fierceness I felt for my son. But then when she arrived, new caverns opened up within me, at least as big as again. 
yet without diminishing the size of the caverns that it opened up for him. It's like one of those impossible pictures of houses with infinitely intertwining steps. It makes no rational sense. It's just one of the miracles of motherhood. The writer Dina Meza has three children, and I'm sure she loved the third one as voraciously as the first two. Since learning about her work, while I do the school and nursery drop-offs, reliant on the knowledge that my children will be safe and nurtured, and that if they need me for anything, I can drop my writing freely and come running, I often think of her waving her three children off to school while being watched over by bodyguards, heading off to report unofficially on a disappearance that echoes her own brother's tragedy, being followed by a car crawling along with no number plate that she pretends not to notice, and wondering whether to answer a call on her tapped phone, hoping that if the voice on the other end issues a threat, the threat will be to her and not, again, to her children. As I collapse onto the sofa with a cup of mint tea after putting my children to bed, I think of her doing the same after returning home, to a new home where armed men are not yet broken in, before summoning the energy to return to her desk and write the words that will rile the powers that be still further with their truth, and will ratchet up the risk to her children once again, for the longer term benefit of the world's children. As I open up a school newsletter asking parents to support a project to plant a set of trees in the playground, she, I think, might this moment be opening a letter saying, don't think you can carry on treacherously undermining our national unity and security. We know where your children go to school now, all three of them, and their routes back to your new home that you told them were the safest ones. I put the newsletter aside and creep back into my children's bedroom. My daughter has shifted herself on the ground on the lower bunk, so she's lying horizontally with one arm dangling off the edge, overseen by the malevolent chicken, whose eyes gleam at me as if in a proprietorial challenge. I bear my bones at it and growl. As I turn her around gently, she sighs and resettles, and I stroke the soft billow of her hair and pull the duvet over her skinny arms. Up on the top bunk, my son has one arm flung around his furry wombat, a present when he was born from a friend down under. And his head is tilted towards the creature's whiskers, his lips slightly parted, as if he'd fallen asleep while telling it an anecdote about a barracuda. The smooth line of his forehead glows in the marmalade light of the city and the moon that seeps through the blinds. 